Thank you. Quite, uh, quite a mouthful, that introduction. Um, thanks for, for attending today. What I wanted to do was talk a little bit about um, the automotive sector and hopefully stuff that you've noticed over the last kind of 12 to 18 months and the changes that's happened. So l let me ask you a question first of all. Hands up who has bought or sold a car in the last 18 months? And keep the hands up if any of that process was digitally. Good, okay, so about three quarters, which is basically what I'm here to talk about today, right? In, in fact, the automotive sector, not uncommon um, from experiencing change, but going through much more change in the last 18 months as part of the pandemic, but also other factors that I'll talk about today. So a little bit about uh, the group. So you probably don't know the name. Um, we were previously a BCA Marketplace. We rebranded uh, towards the end of last year, but we're really part of um, three sectors of our business. So firstly, webuyanycar.com. You probably know the advert. You probably know the face of webuyanycar.com. Um, it is the UK's largest digital buy vehicle uh, service. Um, up to this point, I think we've done about two million vehicles uh, through, through that business. The second part is BCA, and BCA is the B2B part of the business, right, which is taking vehicles from uh, an OEM, uh, sorry, an automotive manufacturer, a leasing company perhaps, and taking them through their kind of second and third life. Um, we run that in, in the UK and Europe, and we do about a million and a half vehicles a year through that process. Um, and finally, <clears throat> again, you probably know the, the face of Cinch. Cinch uh, launched again about uh, nine months ago uh, and is obviously a digital business selling um, quality vehicles in the UK uh, in a B2C environment. So the We Buy Any Car business is obviously very focused on C2B, BCA is very focused on B2B, and Cinch is very focused on um, B2C. So, but really what we try and talk about as a group is we, we affect all parts of the automotive value chain, right? So starting from kind of the top right-hand corner where a vehicle comes out either from a factory in the UK or might get delivered to uh, a port in the UK and docking facility in the UK. We have a transport business, um, so the large transporters that you might see on the road. We will process those vehicles in a dock facility and then transport those new vehicles in and around the UK, mostly to dealerships. Um, and they will then go through their kind of first life. That might be buying someone buying direct from a dealership. That might be a finance company. Uh, and then a, a consumer buying direct from a finance company. And after a period of time, one to two to three years, that vehicle will come back and go through its kind of second life. And that's where it hits our BCA business. So the BCA business will pick up that, that for kind of first, second life of the vehicle. Um, and then we'll sell that on to either another dealership or or a, um, or a finance company, et cetera. Um, and the cycle generally kind of goes through a number of times, right? So a vehicle that you've probably bought in the past, particularly a used vehicle, will have more than one owner, right? Very common to have more than one owner. Um, as it says up there, the average life cycle in, for a vehicle is about 12 to 15 years, right? And that's generally how long uh, a vehicle will be on the market. It is less nowadays, right? As some of the regulations start to bring in um, restrictions on that in particular. Um, but as we go through that, uh, as I mentioned, kind of the remarketing part, which is the B2B side, will then might end up going to back into We Buy Any Car, and then it might go through a cycle and again, uh, a never-ending kind of process until that vehicle at some point will be scrapped and taken off of the road. So the value chain um, that we talk about in relation to how we impact that is, is really everything on this process, whether that's transport, either the large transporters that I mentioned, or single plate drivers, the red plate drivers, um, as well as selling the vehicle in the B2B environment, buying a vehicle back from a consumer in a C2B environment, or cinch and then selling a vehicle to a B2C customer. <coughs> so as I mentioned at the beginning, the automotive industry is not, you know, it's not uncommon to go through, uh, you know, change. Over the last 20 to 30 years, as technology has changed, as consumer demands have changed, then the automotive sector has needed to change as well. When we look at where we are today, you know, we certainly got a number of factors that's impacting the automotive industry. So fast-changing fast consumer needs and trends, 
I think every industry, to be fair, is, is being impacted by that, but the automotive industry in particular, um, people are not wanting necessarily or needing to go to a dealership in the same way that they did 10 to 15 years ago. Advancing digital technologies. So when you think about uh, self-driving vehicles, autonomous vehicles, um, the introduction of uh, EVs and how that's impacting, certainly new technologies that the automotive industry is needing to take into consideration. The value of data. Everything that we do today generates data. A vehicle is no different. Um, I had a stat the other day, it's 1,400 semiconductor chips in a vehicle, and every single one of those is generating and creating data. Um, and as we move into the connectivity piece, you know, most of those vehicles are also connected or are being produced connected. So that data is being collected, assimilated somewhere in the manufacturing industry, as well as needing to look at how we deal with that data. And finally, the, the environmental regulations, right? So um, most of you are aware by 2030, it'll be a, it will be uh, illegal to sell a combustion engine vehicle in the UK and uh, across Europe. So you're now seeing hybrids and also um, electric vehicles coming through and automotive companies having to deal with moving from a very traditional combustion engine to an EV and everything that that brings along with it. Obviously, the pandemic has brought on other challenges. Again, some of these not specific to the automotive sector, right, by any means. But supply chain disruption, uh, as we're probably mostly all in IT, we've been struggling with certainly uh, services and supplies from hardware suppliers and probably will do for, for, for the considerable future, I guess. That's no different in the automotive sector. Again, you were probably seen in the newspapers around um, certainly vehicles in the UK being impacted, new vehicles being impacted in the UK as well as manufacturing plants being impacted by the, by the lack of chips and that's causing uh, challenges in, in, um, in supply. Um, obviously, that's knock on from a price wars perspective, um, which is no dissimilar again to what we've probably faced in the past in the automotive sector, but definitely something which is being assess, as exaggerated by the pandemic at this point in time. Um, consumer expectations. So again, when you look at how we've been operating over the last 18 months, we've been in a world of expecting things to be delivered or easy to purchase because we have had no other choice, right? It's not been easy for us to go and procure things, to buy things. Um, so from an automotive perspective, that's an interesting dynamic when you're buying a 15, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 uh, pound asset. Um, global uncertainties, right? We don't know if this is going to be the only pandemic. We don't know how long this pandemic will continue on for, right? So we have to think about when you look at the future, is something going to change? And then finally, partnerships, right? One way of getting around some of the challenges that I mentioned previously, um, and also the ones brought about by the pandemic, is partnerships. So again, probably as you've been seeing over the last five to 10 years, partnerships in many industries has helped to deal with some of the challenges that, that has come about. So, as I mentioned in the beginning, the automotive industry has continued to go through a level of change and, and it's not been um, necessarily devoid of transformation, but again, through those points that I mentioned, um, we, need to think about, we need to think about how transformation and digitization will affect the automotive industry and how we can use technology to deal with that. So, when you think about some of the challenges that offers us in technology, uh, we, ha we have to think about how we'll apply technology to help with those challenges. So customer expectations. So if you think about buying something on, on Amazon, on a more traditional e-commerce site, how can you apply that in the automotive world? Right? So Cinch is a good example of how we can apply some of those same concepts and some of those same ways of buying on an on a Amazon or an e-commerce platform in the automotive world. Um, new, new markets and commercial opportunities. So obviously the big one is electric vehicles, right? And how we look at electric vehicles, how we think about connected vehicles as well. So all that data that's coming into uh, to automotive manufacturers, but also to us. So when we get a new vehicle in, there'll be a lot of data that we can, that we can clean from that vehicle, but then we have GDPR issues to deal, to deal with. Um, so we have to think about, there are many things around this new world that leads us to new markets, new commercial opportunities, but obviously new technology that needing to support that. 
Um, flexibility and ad adapted adaptability in space and speed and change, I think, is something that we've always had to deal with. Uh, I think if you've been in technology, um, it's again, it's probably been exaggerated over the last 18 months, and I think we've probably felt that. Um, the previous kind of speaker mentioned uh, some of the similar things that we've had to accelerate perhaps two to three years of work in, in six months. Um, and I think that will continue. I think just because we've kind of got over perhaps the, the main challenges with the pandemic, it doesn't mean that the demands from the business have kind of reduced, right? They've kept, they've kept kind of the same speed and pace that we need to, that we need to look at. Uh, technology decisions. What this means is when we look at some of these changing worlds around expectations, around new markets and commercial opportunities, we have to look at different sets of technology. So technology that we didn't necessarily need to have in the past, we may need to we look at that in the future. For example, if we're going to look at delivering vehicles in the same way that we have expectations around Deliveroo or Uber, how do we apply that in the automotive world? How do we let somebody know their vehicle is on the way? Do we give 15 minute time slots? Do we give two hour time slots? Do we show tracking? Do we show GPS of where the vehicle is, et cetera? So thinking about the technology that might be applicable in the automotive world, we can draw parallels to other industries that have already addressed these problems. And the last one, I guess, more, more in line with kind of the pandemic is we don't really know what's gonna happen in the future around uncertainty and ambiguity. Is it going to be the same? Is it going to be different? Do we need to think about uh, having uh, part of the team or, or focused on some uh, time where they can just look at innovation or look at things that might come out of left field, right? Because we don't know where the world is going to go over the next kind of six months, 12 months, et cetera. So that uncertainty remains. So when you look at digitization, I think the key thing to, to bear in mind is that there are often confusions made to digitization versus digitalization. So digitization is really just moving from an analog world into a digital world, right? And I think most, most industries have kind of moved past that from the kind of paper to, to a digital space over the last five to 10 years. When you think about digitization, what we're doing talking about there is using digital technology to collect data, establish trends, um, make better business decisions. And obviously the, the, the very obvious one that we've lived over the last 18 months is moving away from face-to-face -face meetings and moving to, to video meetings, to Zoom, to Teams, et cetera. So when you apply that in the automotive sector, so what have we looked at over the last 18 months? So in the B2B world, so in the BCA world, our auction business operated pre-pandemic across 23 auction sites in the UK. And what happened is we'd run auctions most days. Folks would turn up, walk around a vehicle, look at a vehicle, see a vehicle passing through. That's obviously now totally gone away. We've moved to a fully online digital auction with an auctioneer uh, broadcasting, streamed. We have to look at thinking about, again, bringing in those parallels from other industries. So when you look at searching for a vehicle previously, when you walked around a site, if there were 300, 400, 500 vehicles there, you could go and look at the vehicles that you're interested in. There was no real search, right? When you move that online, you have to think about how we improve that search experience. How does it need to be more like a, a retail kind of search experience? Similarly, when you're looking around a vehicle, you're one to two meters away from it, right? So you can see it might have a scratch. You can see the wheels. You can see if there's been some damage. When you move that online, you need to think about better imaging. So looking at things like artificial intelligence to look at can a camera, can machine learning identify a scratch in a panel as opposed to a human having to do that. So we have to look at those kind of things to show better images for better search for an experience that's fully digital. Looking at different payment functionality um, like open banking and also looking at areas where again, if you're in person in an auction physically there, you can bid on all of the vehicles that come through. You get the opportunity to look at them, you get the opportunity to bid. Um, you get the opportunity to also place a bid in advance with the auctioneer. Again, when you move that online, we have to introduce something which we call proxy bidding, which enables you to place bids up front digitally in advance 
um, to make sure that your bids, if you, because you can't be, if we're running 23, 20, 15 parallel auctions online at the same time, you can't be in every single one. So we have to allow the bidders the ability to kind of bid in advance through proxy bidding. Um, again, we kind of talked about some of this stuff. So when you move digitally, what we need to do is kind of provide those same levels of service that you'd expect in a, in a retail or in a very B2C environment. Um, and that would include lots of things around self-service. So being able to deal with all of the things around my, my account, for example, that again, you'd expect to do in Amazon. Let's think about how we need to do, deal with that as well in the B2B environment. Uh, transport, again, so if you want your vehicle delivered, if you're bidding on a vehicle, you're in Manchester, the vehicle is in Bristol, I need to arrange for that to be delivered. All of that interaction around ordering the transport um, is done digitally where it wasn't done previously, it was done physically in person. Uh, improving the kind of CRM and call center experience. So looking at rolling out platforms like Salesforce to make it a much more improved service again. In the old world, when you were physically at a site, you could go and physically go and talk to someone. You're talking about moving all of that uh, into a digital experience. Click and collect. We had to kind of introduce the principle of click and collect again from the retail world. I want to come and I bought a vehicle online. I physically want to come and pick it up. So let's arrange click and collect. Again, picking up a, a vehicle where you have 10,000 vehicles on a site and you've got 1,000 vehicles being picked up today. Physically arranging how you move and manage all those vehicles, booking in people, etc., is very different to just turning up to a retail store that you know, you're picking up a new pair of shoes, etc. So there is a, a, a lot of challenges around click and collect that we had to introduce. Again, taking the, taking the insight from the retail world, but then kind of applying that in the automotive world. And I mentioned it earlier, kind of delivery tracking again. How do we make sure that people are comfortable that buying a vehicle online, uh, paying 15,000 for a vehicle, that it's gonna turn up when they say it's gonna turn up? What do we need to provide that level of delivery tracking to customers for that comfort to, to continue? Um, so Cinch, again, some of you may have been on the site to have a look. Um, it is an end-to-end -end digital journey in buying a vehicle. So there is no physical interaction required. Go on the line, search find the vehicle if you're wanting to arrange finance. Do all that on the site as well. Um, home delivery or pickup. Again, as we mentioned, you can get it delivered uh, or you can pick it up at a location that suits you. Again, all needs to be arranged digitally, etc. cetera. Um, offers a 14-day return, again, which wasn't kind of prevalent prior to um, pandemic. But again, taking those cues from other experiences in retail and other online experiences. How do we make it similar in the car buying world? Um, and also being able to offer a pie exchange. So you may have your existing vehicle that you want to sell and buy a vehicle from Cinch. All of that, again, can be done online. Your PX, your vehicle, will give you a value for that. Buy that vehicle. And then you can purchase that your new vehicle with the Pi exchange and additional money or finance if you need to. So again, all of that uh, done online and not having to have that in a physical world as it's been previously. Um, sounds great, but I think the other thing which we need to think about is what's enabling this? You know, when you move an industry like an automotive industry from a very physical world, um, A, because of where it used to operate before, but B, because you have a two-ton vehicle that you have to deal with, you need enablers to make that happen. So having the right skills in the team, we've looked and, and moved our team very much from a more traditional organization into you know, looking at things like cloud, um, moving to a very integrated architecture. Um, so new skills that exist obviously in the market, but not something that was uh, prevalent previously in the group. Security, this brings a whole host of security issues, right? When you move your business online from a very physical business where you can see the person in front of you, they're paying in front of you, they're taking the vehicle from, from you in front of you, that you move that online, not only does that bring the ob obviously um, cyber issues, but from a fraud and security perspective, needing to make sure they're all covered off. Um, partners, I think it was part of the discussions today, right? Finding partners that 
have worked in this world before, perhaps again in a different industry, but bringing their skills uh, to bear in the automotive sector and seeing how we can use that to uh, move the organization forwards. And then the final two is obviously having that infrastructure. The obvious one is cloud, right? Giving you that ability to scale, particularly in the online world where we need to move quickly from um, very kind of low volumes to high volumes, particularly for particular auctions that might generate a lot of interest. Um, and then having the right technology, as I mentioned, looking at new technologies that we didn't have previously and bringing that to bear often perhaps with pilots trying to move things along quickly and making sure that we can, we can move fast, meeting those kind of speed and, and agility points I mentioned earlier. So from my, uh, that, that was all I was going to kind of talk about today. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Robert. Um, a few quick questions. Now, obviously, there's a lot of really interesting digital disruption going on there. Um, when it comes to disruption on this kind of scale, how important is marketing and advertising to you when you're promoting a, a new concept and something that's disruptive? I think if, if you've seen the Cinch adverts, you could probably answer that question for you. <laughs> um, I think, you know, launching a new, launching a new business um, at the scale that we're trying to do or even, you know, maintaining market share for um, We Buy Any Car. Mm. Marketing and, and advertising and having the right brand set up is extremely important. Um, so from our point of view, whatever we do from a technology point of view is supporting, is always supporting the business and always supporting the marketing piece. So, yes, it's extremely important. Um, it's definitely probably the largest expenditure that we'll have, certainly, you know, in the business uh, currently when you're launching in the launch year. And when it comes to, um, to Cinch, um, I mean, that's, there's a lot of visibility um, around that at the moment. Um, is there a certain demographic that you're finding is more receptive to that whole concept of buying a car, sight unseen, everything online? Um, surprisingly not, actually. I think it's, it's something which... Um, you know, you're not really 100% sure. I mean, the, the hypothesis prior to starting was that obviously you're going to attract uh, certainly younger buyers to it, but actually surprising how many, I'm, how many people I meet um, my age, middle-aged people that say, you know, I went on to Cinch, uh, I met someone the other day, they said I went on to Cinch, I bought three cars, you know, for myself, for my wife, for my daughter. So I think it's... It's not, and, and, and that's not necessarily down purely to us, because I think it's, it is the fact that we're, what we're trying to do is bring an experience that they're very familiar with elsewhere. So bring that experience into something that is previously hasn't had that. I think you have the opportunity to make it open to all. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, a couple of questions I've got here from the audience as well. Um, now, what are your thoughts on automated vehicles and their impact on liability when it comes to insurance? And it says here, uh, sounds a little bit... Um, is there a plan between the insurance and auto industries? Uh, I'm not sure I'm ideally placed to answer <laughs> that uh, question. Um, I mean, I, I think the short answer is I don't think anybody probably knows, to be honest, where, where that's going. Um, if, if anyone has bought you know, uh, a newer vehicle recently, particularly the electric vehicles, they are doing a lot more driving for you. So, I mean, I think that's certainly the way things are going and obviously with autonomous vehicles coming through so but I couldn't answer the question on insurance that's not really my yep. forte understood understood okay so one final question uh, the last few years you've become integral in a number of retailers do you think this has enabled you to scale without the inherent risk of quote going it alone um, I think the group has been lucky previously because we operate across the value chain that I showed uh, previously. So I think what that does is obviously de-risk when you're looking to launch new businesses like Cinch, for example. Um, but also then gives you the opportunity to try out new things and then provide a view. I think certainly, for example, you know, we, we do all of the um, internal moves for vehicles for Cinch ourselves, right? Because we have a, a transport business. Now, if we were using a third party or partner for that, the experience would have certainly been different, I'm not saying it's going to be you know, wor uh, better or worse, but it would have been different. But having it in our control enables us to 
um, make sure that all the parts of it that we want to change, change. We can have it how we like it, but obviously working with a third party in that world, it might, might have been different. So I think it's perhaps more the, the scale of the group, um, the fact that we operate across the value chain has given us the ability to, to launch businesses like Cinch um, and to strengthen some of the other businesses. OK. All right, uh, that's all we've got time for. So please, everyone, thank you. Robert. Thank you. Thank you. See you in a second.